We'll wait three more minutes. Um, so I want to introduce our reviewers. 
There's Rachel Burrell, a librarian here at Marlboro, and Todd Smith, and Saskia Durama, and Kelly Dickey, and Tommy Arsenault. And one of the fun things we've done in the past is um, if you guys have any thoughts about the collection of books that we have, um, some people talked about, they realized that they all represented a period in their life, or some people saw some similarities between them, um, and that's fun. So, you don't have to, but if you want to just take a minute to talk about your collection as a whole. Sure, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about this. <laughs> uh, my books sort of all represent areas of scholarship or interest um, from the second half of my life, uh, with the exception of one book, which is more of a fun fact. <laughs> I didn't really collect mine with a particular theme in mind, but as I was making some notes about them, I think I realized that they sort of represent, for the most part, um, experiences are very different from my own. And maybe it's that is really helping me about my own life and culture. So it's a common thread to do that. Um, I have a list of books on my computer that I've kept since uh, fourth grade, and they're all from that of books I've read. And they're all from that. Um, and they're all sort of, I realized, fictional fiction and like fantasy and fantastical. Um, and they all do kind of come from different times of my life. And they're all things that I still read on a regular basis. Um, I did not think about this before, <laughs> but um, I guess a lot of my books are uh, about Latin American history, just because that's what I've been studying for a long time. And then there's some. Other things that I really like in there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that there's any uh, theme. A lot of the works here are like non-fiction works of uh, like politics or philosophy, and those have definitely influenced my thinking. But I think in a lot of ways, you know, the fiction, in some way, has given me like uh, a particular perspective of like a human existence that has changed the way that I view everybody, or like given me a perspective that I can no longer ignore. For sure. So, we might as well just start. <laughs> I don't know who's on first. I'm on first. Alright. Do I just like go? Yeah, just okay. go. Yeah. This is uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf by Edward Alley. It's a play about um, two couples. Uh, the husband of both of the couples are professors at a university. Um, one of them is a very old professor that's been there for a while, and the other one is a professor. And basically this play is about uh, both couples together for drinks after a party um, and basically the older couple holds the younger couple hostage in their apartment throughout the course of the night as their uh, like sanity slowly and slowly slips, slips away as they get in passive aggressive arguments using the uh, the younger couple as um, like pawns in a game that they're playing and it was really interesting to me because uh, I was really fascinated by this idea of um, uh, like slipping into different states of mind or like this like slow decay of uh, like the mentality of the characters as the night goes on and like uh, um, like uh, logic and like rational reasoning for things kind of like dissipates as well and then uh, like you see the absurdity of their situation comes out and little by little you learn more and more about what the older couple has actually been arguing about the entire night and that is who's at the end. It's really interesting. Okay, this, my first book is called Library, an Unquiet History by Bath of Battles. <laughs> uh, it's a really hippie book. Uh, Bath of Battles is a, an interesting character. He's a rare books library at um, the Bynecker Library at Harvard, which is a rare books library. Um, and he also is now the director of the Meta Lab at Harvard and a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Um, so all that means is, is that he works in history and the changing roles of libraries, um, um, particularly their roles in culture. And so this book, unsurprisingly, documents that history of the library, um, and particularly it looks at the library as a repository of knowledge and what that means. Um, so it's a really fascinating look about how cultures have over time viewed and documented knowledge um, and how they sought to organize it and preserve it and sometimes how they have lost knowledge, um, particularly in the case of the burning Alexandria libraries. Um, we lost a lot on that day. <laughs> Um, it also sort of talks about the challenges we face today um, when it comes to storing and retaining the proportion of knowledge that sometimes is going just from one line. 
Work disperses and time passes by Hans Christian von Baer. I didn't mean to start off with this book, but uh, it's the first on the list. Um, it's, it's, uh, I have a number of science fiction books in my list, and I thought it would be cool to include one that's definitely not science fiction, but it kind of has a similar effect of revealing something about the world around us that we may not be all that familiar with. The subtitle is The History of Heat. And I think it's really engaging. You have to work a little bit to follow the book, but you have to work to follow someone else who writes very complicated um, materials. So if you're a literature student, you can all go up off and you can kind of work on the book. But it, um, it's about this fundamental property of the physical world, the nature of heat, or what in chemistry we call thermal energy. And why, as the book says, literally, why does warmth disperse? Why does your coffee cup cool gradually as it sits on the table? And Philip's cup of tea instead of the opposite. Why doesn't once in a while it just kind of spontaneously gather heat and start to boil in your hand? My next book is The Vertigo Years, Year of 1900 to 1914 by Philip Blum. Um, the beginning of the 20th century was a really tumultuous time for Europe. Um, they saw significant changes in technology. Um, advances in um, moral values and globalization, immigration changes, consumerism was on the rise, um, there's a shifting rivalry of superpowers. And so Flom attempts to look at all of those um, great upheavals going year by year, chapter by chapter, um, through 1914, when of course World War I began and sort of started another shift in upheaval. Um, he uses a lot of examples from art and literature, um, politics, economics, social structures. He looks at the whole gamut of things going on in Europe during this time. Um, and so it's really, really a really great overarching view of what all these things sort of meant for Europe and the, the countries in Europe. Um, of particular interest, of course, being the librarian, I was really jazzed about this, is the 25-page bibliography. <laughs> <laughs> So if you are interested in researching this topic, this is a good book for that. Um, this is Theater of the Oppressed written by Augusto Boal, who was a dramaturg from Sao Paulo, Brazil in the 70s. And basically this is an anthology of works that he wrote about uh, a, a theater group that he opened in the favelas in Sao Paulo um, that used experimental theater practices as a means of uh, like political and social organizing in this, in this uh, like pretty poverty-stricken area of Brazil. He later went on to be, uh, um, I think it was like the, the mayor of Sao Paulo. Uh, he ran as a joke. But anyway, he's like a really fascinating guy. And th this is the like essays that led to the culmination of his works, which is uh, the theater of the oppressed. It's a pedagogy for theater um, that, that uses a lot of interactive like audience participatory and improvised theater and movement practices as like a forum for discussion or like uh, problem solving and like creating new like sustainable groups. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing. He looks really cool. He's like really friendly guy. He's like very happy. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and this practice is uh, still going on all over the world, even though he's dead. Okay, me again. <laughs> uh, this book is How Buildings Learn: What Happens After They're Built from Stuart Brand. Um, so if communities are ecosystems, uh, Brand posits that buildings are living organisms uh, within those communities. Uh, he really looks at the, how buildings evolve after they're built, um, and he looks at buildings as sort of adaptable and repurposable spaces. Uh, he looks at the fluidity of space and structure and the interaction of buildings and their uses, so form and function, that, that web and flow. Um, it is very richly illustrated with examples of all these things that he means. Um, and one example I have here is this um, across two pages here. You can see this is one cliff where one building has been located, but it has changed at least nine times over the course of its history to adapt to different purposes and different owners. Um, and so it's a really fun look at how buildings can really adapt to people um, and needs over time. Um, of particular interest also is his little piece on shipping containers um, and how we have used things that were not traditionally buildings as buildings. Um, and so there's some great sites out there on the web too if you're looking into shipping containers at homes. Um, there's a lot of good advice to, to look out for. <laughs> oh, me. 
Um, this book is called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, and it's by Susan Cain, and you might have seen her TED Talk online, but uh, this book actually changed my life because it's talking about how, like, the value to being an introvert, and that it's not all bad to, like, not be an extrovert, and so there's a lot of studies that she references to back it up, and, um, like, people that are more sensitive actually have their skin literally their skin. That's crazy. And um, <laughs> some people taste lemons differently than other people, depending on whether they're introverts or extroverts. And so it's really cool. And it also ta uh, it talks about some like uh, how introverts uh, get tired from social stimulation. So building little breaks into your day if you're an introvert and like ways to manage your own personality so that you can take care of yourself. It's really cool. Um, this is Free Pizza for Life. It's a memoir by Chris Clavin, who is the, arguably the person who started the folk punk movement in the early 90s in Bloomington, Indiana, and also started uh, Planet X Records, which is one of the largest and only uh, major record labels for folk punk music. He's still running it entirely by himself in Bloomington with uh, dozens and dozens of artists signed. And this is a memoir about uh, like the earlier days of that record label when he was running it out of his van. He was homeless for a very long time, running this record label selling cassettes out of his van for bands that he liked. And it's like an incredible story of his uh, like transition from being like a homeless punk in Bloomington, Indiana, to like starting what is now one of the like uh, most fastly evolving punk movements uh, around. And it also is all, it, it tangentially is uh, a story about his friend Sam, who is the person who uh, like started Planet X with him, and her transition um, from being a man to a woman throughout the course of the book. And it's like a really interesting perspective. Uh, to, to, to come with the story of the formation of this record label. Um, yeah, <laughs> done. <laughs> All right, so my next book is called Broadcasting a Civil War in El Salvador, a memoir of guerrilla radio, and it's definitely the coolest book I've ever read. Uh, the author was the leader of the guerrilla radio movement in El Salvador during the Civil War. Um, his code name was Santiago, and it just talks about his and his colleagues struggled to keep the radio running so that people like in the countryside could have news, or people in the city could have news of what was going on because the government cut off most of the radio waves. So um, there's stories about them like running from mountain to mountain in the middle of the night with all their equipment and stuff, and um, just hiding out on the their side of the fighting lines to continue the radio, which is really cool and really important. And um, you get to see into the, the team that works together, so like there are characters with a little bit of personality. Um, it's really good. <laughs> the coroner's lunch, Colin Cotterill. Um, these books, this is a series of books. This is the first in a series, and a lot of times the series can get a little uh, old after a few books, but I find this very engaging. You have to read, I think I'm on the fifth one. Um, they take place in post revolution Laos, so late 1970s, mid to late 70s. Um, and this book and others um, are about Dr. Siri Pavong. I'm probably not saying that right. I listened to a tape once, and I think it was pronounced Dr. Silly more, more than Dr. Siri. But um, he's a, an old guy, he's um, in his 70s. He's, a doctor, but he's talked into being a, coron a coroner when uh, the um, violations are trying to rebuild their society and they have very few professionals, and so if you're a doctor, you can be a coroner. Um, there's a lot of uh, mysticism in the book. The writing is very clever. There's a lot of this kind of gentle repartee between uh, uh, old, old friends. Um, I think I find the book engaging because the writing style is this kind of simple, witty style. The author does a really remarkable job, I think, of showing and not telling it makes the um, scenes, the settings really come alive. Okay, um, this is Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech, which is a children's book, but was um, my favorite children's book when I was little. She just has a really, really warm style of storytelling that is extremely beautiful. Um, it talks, the main character is this girl who goes on a road trip with her grandparents and it talks about her relationship with her mother who is dead and um, her friends at school. Uh, she's a really intuitive and insightful kid which 
makes for a more interesting read. Um, yeah, I still feel like this is a really special book to me, even though I haven't read it in a while, but um, it's really beautiful. Can I go to my next book now? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is Days and Nights of Love and War by Eduardo Galeano, who is a fantastic Latin American writer. He's from Uruguay, but he's also a historian, so he writes a lot about like all of Latin America. Um, I'm going to read part of it. This is It's a series of vignettes which are talking about the coup in Argentina, but also about a lot of other things. So this one is called, I was made of clay, but also of time. Ever since I was a little boy, I knew that memories didn't exist in heaven. Adam and Eve didn't have a past. Can you live each day as if it were the first? Um, and I really like that, and it's, he's a really talented writer. Um, And then my next book <laughs> is The Book of Qualities by J. Ruth Gendler, which this actually might be my favorite book. Um, so the premise is that the, the narrator goes to the wind, and the wind teaches her how to approach these different qualities. And so honor, creativity, whimsy, terror, they're all personified. And so she's talking about them as people and how um, her relationship with them, I guess, can I read one of them? Sure. Do you, can someone give me a quality? <laughs> Curiosity. Curiosity. Okay. Well, that's hard. I'm just going to open it up. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to do longing instead. <laughs> longing studies archaeology. She is at home in the future as well as the past. She collects mirrors and antique necklaces. The lamps in her living room have embroidered shades, silk with beaded fridges. She takes long walks in the early autumn evening when everything looks dark green and purple and brown and deep blue, and the windows of the little houses shine yellow from the lights inside. Longing speaks the language of dreams. She is a dancer and an actress. She knows tides and currents and pirates. She has swum in all the oceans and traveled to places that the rest of us have only visited in our sleep. Although I have met Longing many times, it is not easy to describe her appearance. She dresses herself with an awareness of where she is going and who will be there. It is more than the costumes, though. Even the gossip columnist who notices everything could not quite remember Longing's height or the color of her sea-filled eyes. If you must see her, invite her to a concert. She is especially fond of the music of string instruments. Uh, my next book is Black Tool from Tim de Grasse. Um, it is of Deutsch, but we have an English copy, and there is a film version um, by the new German cinema director, Volker Schindorf. Uh, Schindorf, sorry. So there's that for you as well, if you don't speak German. But this book is really fantastic. It is an exemplar of trauma literature, which is the literary epoch that happened just after World War II in Germany. Um, and it really stands in sharp contrast to the rhetoric and the motifs that were employed by the National Socialists. So in this book, um, as well as other books from this period, you'll find that there's a lot of simple, direct language that is being used to explore very dark topics of guilt and escapism, um, destruction and return. So it's a really interesting juxtaposition in that way. Um, the novel revolves around this young boy, Oscar, who at the age of three decides he is never going to grow up. Um, he remains very, very small physically, um, but he really suffers the surreal experiences during everyday life of war that are very adults um, for this very young person who does not ever want to become one. <laughs> Um, this is Multitude by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, and it's probably the most influential book I've ever read. It is the second part of a three-part trilogy that they wrote, Empire, Multitude, and Commonwealth. Um, the first book, Empire, was about uh, how globalization has changed sovereignty to no longer be marked by individual states or corporations or organizations, but instead a network of exploitation, which is really depressing. But this book, <laughs> not so depressing, is about how that same uh, forces of social interaction and globalization specifically can also form a new political body called the multitude, which to them is a more perfect model of democracy. Um, and this is also the most accessible of the three books. It's, uh, there are parts of it that are hard to get through, but by, by far is one of the most accessible pieces of political theory I've ever read. 
And also, the writing is really beautiful because Antonio Negri is this really old Italian political theorist who was part of the like autonomous movement in the early 40s in Italy. He was in prison for a long time. Um, and uh, Michael Hart is a, a literary critic and comparative literature professor at Notre Dame, so he does most of the like actual writing, and it's really beautiful. Okay. Next on my list is Dune, and uh, I just want to show the difference in these two books. This is what I, I was reading, I guess, when I was a kid, and I printed it, and I opened it up, and the print is micro, but now they, they print too bigger, and the book is lost. <laughs> <laughs> I read a comment somewhere that there's an inverse relationship between the quality of a book and the number of made up words in the book. Um, <laughs> this book has some made up words, uh, like a lot of science fiction does, but Frank Herbert uh, uses them to create such a complete exotic universe that that rule is clearly false. And um, it's about, I, I tried to write something about what it was about, it was difficult. It's about politics on the scale of planets and solar systems with the players. Uh, in this political scheme, these families, uh, family loyalties. Um, at the center is a drug that they call spice, which is harvested from this dangerous uh, desert-like planet that also happens to be home to these giant worms. Um, this universe, so a lot of science fiction, I think sometimes people get hung up on whether it's the universe that's created by the author is internally consistent and whether you can really kind of lose yourself in that. And I'd say this definitely is, um, and it helps you think about um, problems that we encounter in our own world, but in a very different kind of setting. Um, it's weird, and sometimes you don't understand what's happening, and it takes you a long time to puzzle it out, which I think is definitely part of the fun of the, of the book. Uh, my next book is The Water Method Man from John Irving. Um, Irving is absolutely one of my favorite authors, and this might not be his best novel, but um, I love it for maybe sentimental reasons, and you know, when I read it in the time of my life, but. It is really neat. Um, like in other of his novels, Irving tends to portray New England personas, um, flawed characters. He talks um, with great frankness about um, the vicissitudes of life, the woes of life, um, sex, uh, relationships, all these things um, are, are not taboo to Irving. Um, so in this novel, he really <laughs> depicts the, the narrator's life very lovingly, but also extremely humorously. Um, he has a lot of, the narrator has a lot of failures and flops um, in his love life and in his personal life. Um, he's a struggler, uh, or a liar and a struggling grad student um, whose ex-wife has just left him for his best friend. Um, and he also has a chronic urinary tract infection, <laughs> which he employs the water method, uh, water method to treat instead of actually dealing with it um, like a normal adult. <laughs> so it's a really interesting uh, development of this narrator. My turn. <laughs> so my first book is uh, Red Wall by Brian Back. And um, this, I read this when I was very small, and I've read it every couple of years since then. It's um, basically basically about talking animals, um, but it's these woodland creatures who live in an abbey, and um, this this rat named Clooney the Scourge shows up and wants to destroy their way of life, basically. Um, and it's this amazing, fantastical world with um, complex characters and relationships, but they're all woodland creatures. Um, and this is one of many, many books. Um, I would read this one first because I think it's the best. Um, but it's this really complex, fantastical world that has its own history, and um, and and this is just a moment in this amazing landscape that he's created. Um, and I love it a lot. Um, this is Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wayne Jones, also a children's book. Also, yes, uh, Miyazaki made it into a movie. Uh, Miyazaki has, uh, many of his movies have been influenced by the works of Diana Wine Jones, which mostly consist in the same universe, which is kind of cool. But this one is about uh, um, a, a girl named Sophie who uh, uh, one day is met, met meets a witch who turns into an old woman, which doesn't really bother her that much because she pretty much just made hats all day anyway. Um, but basically, what I like about Diana Wine Jones' writing is not necessarily, like, the characters are nice and, like, the worlds are really interesting, but um, she has this like incredible, I'm not sure if she's Welsh herself, I probably should have looked it up, but like a lot of the language is derived um, from like Welsh and a lot of the like uh, like sentence structures are of that quality, so it's like really interesting to read. It's like not the kind of prose that you would expect 
in many like books uh, of like American English, uh, especially <laughs> children's books. So like, while it may be confusing at points, it is also a children's book, so it's not that confusing. But uh, yeah, there's like really interesting wording in like sentence structure. Um, this is the Petrola from Kafka, Franz Kafka. Um, Kafka authored three novels in his lifetime. Um, all three went unpublished um, until Max Brode posthumous, oh, I can never say this word, but published it after his death <laughs> um, and famously ignored, ignored Kafka's wish to have all of his works destroyed upon his death. Um, and this was the first of those three novels. When Brode published it, he rearranged some chapters um, and sort of made some guesses about how it would work well and gave it a different title, America. And if you're looking for the English version of that, you'll find it under that title, America, which we own as well. This um, edition goes back, though, to Kafka's manuscripts and really takes it literally from those manuscripts and puts it together um, in the correct way that Kafka intended um, and gives it the title that also Kafka intended. But this is a super funny book um, about this young boy who, after getting caught in a scandalous affair with the, the housemaid, is sent by his parents to live with his uncle in New York. Uh, his uncle is a businessman. Uh, but from the moment the ship arrives in the port, uh, Carl, the main character, is just plagued with misunderstandings and missteps. And it's a classic Kafkaesque novel in that sense, uh, but focusing on a young boy, which is sort of unsurprising for Kafka. Ordinary Wolf, uh, Seth Kantner, is about a, um, I guess it starts off in the kid, the narrator, the main character is a preteen, he's growing up with his dad and sister in this single room cabin, igloo like structure in really remote Alaska. Um, and he didn't really choose that, his parents moved to Alaska um, to kind of get away from modern society, got in the lower as they call it, and um, he grows up in this rural lifestyle and really embraces it. Um, but then he just feels drawn to the other larger culture in the outside world and wants to go experience that. And it's about the characters that he meets and who influence his lives. But I think that the thing that um, I find most compelling about it is, again, just like with the other books that I've mentioned, how foreign that world is. And it's not that far away from ours, really. We can go there, we don't have to go to Laos to experience a kind of something so different from our own existence. Um, we can go to Alaska and experience that. Oh, actually, okay. So this is The City Reader. Um, this is an anthology that's edited by two urban studies scholars, um, and it features some really important classic and essential texts in the study, um, or in the field of urban studies. Um, the texts are, are arranged not chronologically, um, but instead by subject matter. Um, so it really helps to show that this is a really interdisciplinary work. Um, and it shows the interdisciplinary approach to urban studies. Um, it contains really important works that um, in the disciplines of urban sociology and cultural studies, urban geography, urban politics and economics, um, regional planning, urban planning, urban design. Um, so you can see it cuts across a lot of different things. Um, and the newest version um, is it is now in its fifth edition, I should say, um, and it's been out for a long time, so you can see that it's, it's continually updated. Um, and its newest edition has an altogether new section on the city and the global context and looking at the city and the global society at large. Um, and it also is much more expanded to include better introductions to the chapters. So it's also a good book if you're uh, doing research in this area. So this is El Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine, um, and it is a version of Cinderella. Um, and it, the reason she um, she gets enchanted uh, as a baby and by not her fairy godmother, but another fairy that comes to her birth, and she whenever she's given an order, she has to obey it if she's given a direct order. Um, and and so she. Her mother dies, and like Cinderella, and she lives with, um, and then her father dies, and she lives with her stepmother, um, and her stepsisters, and um, they don't know about the curse per se, um, but they figure it out and um, and make her life hell, and then she goes on a quest to find the fairy, the fairy who cursed her, so that um, 
because she's the only one who can undo it. Um, and it's it's really interesting. It, I'm not making it sound like it, but it is. It's um, a really interesting take on the Cinderella fairy tale. Um, it, rather than just having these people in her house who she listens to, she has to listen to them. Um, and she needs a prince and everything. <laughs> but that's the sad point. Okay, <laughs> let me get it. Um, so this is Red by John Logan, um, which is a play about Mark Rothko. Um, and it's a two-person play. It's, uh, the characters are Mark Rothko and his assistant, whose name is Ken, but is never named. He's never actually named um, in the play. And um, it takes place a couple of years before Mark Rothko kills himself. Um, and it's basically um, these, two, these two people who they, say, they spend the whole play, it spans it spans a couple of years, two or three years, um, and they spend the whole play basically arguing and discussing about art and what art means and what color means um, because at this point Roth was really into red um, and he, uh, if you've seen his paintings, they're all basically just blocks of color. Um, and, and they have these really interesting discussions and, and uh, the assistant kind of treats him like his therapist and and Rothko uh, is very treats him very much as an assistant because that is his job and it, their relationship is really interesting um, throughout the whole thing and it, it develops throughout the whole thing. <laughs> this is uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross by David Emmett, who is actually a professor at Marlboro for one semester and is now a super famous playwright. But anyway, <laughs> this is a this is a play about businessmen, uh, like hyper masculine, like fast talking businessmen, like much of the stereotypes of like the eighties businessman persona. Um, and what is really interesting about this is uh, like more over than any other uh, like play that tries play or movie or book that tries to exemplify that um, like kind of culture. Uh, his dialogue is like absolutely incredible. It's like really, really interesting to, to listen to. There's also like a lot of debate over whether or not David Mamet is actually a misogynist or if he just writes about misogynists. That's, I don't know, take that as you will, but it's uh, definitely offensive at times. And the characters are not particularly sympathetic. A few of them are, but uh, yeah, it's just like a really interesting, um, the story I guess is mostly irrelevant, but it's like really interesting series of dialogue of, among very interesting characters. Uh, and it goes very, very quickly, and there's a lot of cursing. I think it wants to, it's got like some record for the most amount of curse words in a play or something. <laughs> <laughs> this one doesn't have a picture. So this is um, Stranger in the Kingdom by Howard Frank Mosier. This is, uh, out of all the books that I've brought today, this is, I think, my favorite. Um, just the way it creates a kind of unique, um, a, a unique little world in the Northeast Kingdom, this region of Vermont um, called the Northeast Kingdom Rural. This takes place in the 1950s. It's rural, it's a farming community, mostly poor. The nearest big town is Montpelier. Uh, you might think it would be Burlington, but you can't really get to Burlington from the Northeast Kingdom. At least um, you couldn't get there easily. And even if you did today, you'd probably go through Montpelier. Um, a young kid whose dad's the editor of a local paper, so his dad's kind of a intellectual, but the town is filled with these, uh, I guess what you just call characters. Um, and they come from all different backgrounds, and I think part of the idea of the book is um, not to judge people, except for certain people who you have to read the book to kind of find out why that is. Um, <laughs> it's, it's at times, um, I have a lot of my time yet, I don't think so, I'm going to this time. <laughs> It's at times kind of a romp, at times uh, very serious and, and tragic, um, but it's just the diversity of people that make up this world that is um, really rich and uh, exciting. Um, and I love the way that I, I think the care with which the author has created this book and these people is lovely. Uh, this next book is Degenerate Art, The Attack on Modern Art in Nazi Germany, 1937. Um, this if you wade through the 700s, this is one of the fantastic gems in that area. Um, this book was published by the Neue Gallery, which hosted an exhibition um, on degenerate art. Um, I'll note the Neue Gallery is really fantastic. It's on the Upper East Side of New York, and it features um, a permanent exhibits on German and Austrian Expressionism. Um, so I'll give my plug for that. 
Um, but this work, um, the, the exhibit rather, was a recreation of the 1937 Nazi art shows that were held in Munich that aimed to teach the German public about what art should be. Um, and it also had the second aim of condemning modern and modernist art that was being produced by the expressionists, Dadaists, uh, new, new objection, objectionists, uh, surrealists, and so forth. Um, and all of those modern artists were deemed as degenerates who produced degenerate work. Um, that's straight from the Nazi ideal. And so you'll find a lot of beautiful pictures, uh, lots of it in color, just really good examples of all those things in here. <laughs> Um, this is The Death for the People by Huey Newton. It's an anthology of essays that Huey Newton wrote when he was in the Black Panthers. Um, and what I find interesting about this book is uh, they're, they're, the essays are presented chronologically, and it provides this really interesting insight into the changing ideals of the Black Panther Party over the course of their uh, like popularity. Because uh, a lot of people think that the Black Panther Party is this, like, uh, I mean, yes, they're a militant group, but they're not necessarily a group that was um, like stubborn or like stuck in their ways. Their ideology and practice had changed very significantly from their inception to their uh, like decline. Uh, and this book, I think, really details that incredible self-criticism and that like changing ideology throughout the course of their time. Um, also, you can't really recommend to die for the people without also recommending Elaine Brown's A Taste of Power, which is a criticism of the practices of specifically Dewey Newton and the Black Panther, Panthers generally. Okay, I have five in a row. Um, <laughs> 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 um, so this is Logan's Run by uh, William Nolan and George uh, Clayton Johnson. And um, this sort of was the basis for my plan. Um, <laughs> It's a sci-fi book. Um, it takes place in a futuristic world on Earth. Um, and it's in this world, um, when you reach the age of 21, you uh, are required to report to the government for execution. Um, there is not a single person in this world who is older than 21. Um, and the, it focuses on Logan, who is a uh, their version of policemen who basically their job is to hunt down people who run from that execution. Um, and it, it's interesting because it starts, the book starts with him on his last day um, and he's chasing someone who's running and then, and this person gives him a clue to sanctuary, which is this mythical place where if you make it there, you don't have to die. Um, and so he spends the whole book searching for sanctuary at first to um, to find it and destroy it and turn it into the government. Um, and he, he goes on this journey and develops throughout the book. Um, and I won't say what happens at the end, but it, his character ends up being really interesting. Um, OK. Uh, I Love the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. Um, I actually haven't read this in a really long time. Um, I read this for the first time in third grade, um, it was required, uh, and and I fell in love with it. It's um, this girl um, who gets stranded on an island because uh, her tribe leaves her. Um, she and her brother, and then, and this all happens at sort of the beginning, um, and her brother gets killed um, by uh, like feral dogs that are on the island. Um, and she ends up making friends with one of the dogs, and so she's on this island for many years, um, and she, uh, she makes friends with animals, and uh, there are people who who come to the island, um, but she has very little contact with them. Um, and it's it's an amazing story of a girl who has to learn how to survive on her own, um, and to do jobs that are traditionally male jobs um, in her tribe. And, um, and I'll stop there. <laughs> um, by Edith Patel, I think. Just, I have no idea. Um, this is another one that's based on uh, fairy tales. Um, it's kind of Beauty and the Beast meets the Snow Queen. Um, it's uh, this girl who um, her her it's in sort of the Nordic somewhere in the Nordic area, um, and sh this polar bear comes to her house and basically tells her family that. Uh, who are very poor, that they will be okay if she comes to live with him in his ice castle. Um, 
And so she goes because she loves, she sneaks out because her family doesn't want her to go, and she goes anyway. Um, and then uh, she can't, they can't speak. Um, obviously, he's a polar bear, he can't speak, really. Um, <laughs> and um, so she spends her time like in this ice castle weaving, and um, and I don't want to give it away, but <laughs> it's basically Beauty and the Beast. Um, <laughs> 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 Um, so this is a lot of the first adventure by Tamar Pierce. This is, if I had to pick one book or one series of books, if I were on a desert island and I could never read anything else ever again, it would be this. Um, this is one of many books that she's written, and they all take place in this world that is a sort of medieval fantasy land. Um, and it's, she, at age 11, she and her twin brother are sent, she is sent to um, this convent to learn how to be a lady, and he is sent to uh, the palace to learn how to be a knight, and she, because they're twins, and she desperately wants to be a knight, she, they switch places, and she goes to the palace and has to pretend to be a boy um, for the entire, I think it's eight years that she is becoming a knight. And um, and he goes he does he goes to, and to the convent and then tells them that he's a boy and really he's there to study magic because that's what he wants to do. Um, and and so this this one is her um, first year. I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> um, this one is her first year. The next one is um, her her page years and uh, then she becomes a knight. And then um, this series is about her. The next series is about another girl who. Um, who then meets her when she's older, and then the next series is about uh, the first uh, girl who is allowed to train to be a knight, and then the next series is about Alana's kids. Um, so this whole world is connected, and it's amazing, and I'm done. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the Woogie Norfolk story by Daniel Pinkwater, um, and this is this was one of my all-time favorite books as a child. Mostly because um, the names are unbelievable. The um, the the son's name is King Waffle. Um, the mom is Bigfoot the Chipmunk, um, and the dad is Lunchbox Willie. Um, they and so basically they get this cat named Woody Norville. And every day um, the dad comes home from work and says that cat looks like he's bigger than insert animal here. <laughs> and, and they all go, no, he's not. And then the next day he comes home with that animal and says, see, I told you. Um, <laughs> and it, it keeps going and going until until they have like a dog, a pig, a horse, a something. And then eventually the cat is bigger than an elephant. Um, and they all have these amazing names. Um, Paper Cup Mix Master, uh, Exploding Pop Tart is the horse. Um, they're, they're, all of them are like that. It's ridiculous and amazing. And, and, but it's not print. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Alive is by Piers Paul Reed, and it tells the story about um, a plane crash that happened in 1972. This small plane is carrying uh, about 40 people, mostly members of a rugby team from Uruguay and a lot of their family members. Um, they're flying from Uruguay to Chile, so they have to cross the Andes, and the plane crashes high in the Andes, and um, a lot of the people survive. Not everyone survived, but a lot of people survive. And the book is a careful reconstruction of the crash, and then the ordeal endured by the survivors of the crash. Over two months, they survived um, in this uh, snow-covered Andes mountains. Um, the plane really wasn't carrying any food except for snacks they brought with them. So, and the survivors were mostly um, young men and boys. So, how did they survive for so long in this in these kind of um, horrible um, conditions? So, the author doesn't sensationalize the story um, or make it overly sentimental. It's a really uh, riveting, I would say, presentation of the faith, the friendship the sheer willpower that gets the survivors through their ordeal. Um, it's not like a, Holly, a, a heroic Hollywood tale. The amazing thing is that so many of the people survived that he could actually do first-person interviews with the survivors and reconstruct this story. Um, this is Get in the Van, a memoir written by Henry Rollins about his time in the hardcore punk band Black Flag from 1980 to 1986. Black Flag is famous for being one of the most uh, like 
uh, controversial and like hardworking punk bands of all time. They did uh, like crazy like 200 day tours. Um, and it's really just like an incredible book um, detailing that movement, which was a really like uh, difficult movement. It was like really dark and gruesome, full of a lot of masochism and uh, like self hatred. And I think this memoir, in a lot of ways, details uh, like just how like the emotional states of those people during this time. Uh, like a movement mostly uh, created by children like 13 to 18 years old. Um, it is really like incredible what they were able to do and like the like the work ethic of these people, but also like. Um, yeah, it was like definitely a very dark time, and this book is also full of incredible like photos, you know, like band photos and uh, a lot of like posters. They managed to salvage many of the posters they had from touring, uh, and it's just like a really incredible book full of uh, like interesting insights to a subculture during that period of time that not a lot of people know about. Uh, and it's just incredible to me to know that it existed. This is Garbage Land on the Secret Trail of Trash by Elizabeth Royton. Um, of all the books in my pile, this is possibly my favorite. Um, if you've ever wondered what happens to the trash that you throw into your bins and put it to the curb, um, or if you've ever been in New York City in the summer and seen a mountain of garbage and wondered where could that possibly go, this book is for you. Um, Brisa is a science and nature writer, and she really does take you on the trail of trash. Um, and she looks at how much we consume, first of all, in, in the terms of buying things. Uh, and then how much garbage we produce based on that. Um, what makes up that garbage in terms of things that are recyclable, things that are toxic, and so forth. Um, she talks about how many tons of garbage garbage people throw into the trucks every day. It's remarkable. It's in the tons, truly. Um, she talks about recycling um, and landfilling and different ways that we deal with garbage. Um, in, in particular, the it's coming on Christmas chapter is quite neat because it focuses on that consumerism aspect um, and all the waste that is produced by um, the holiday, including Christmas trees. My last book is Straight Man by Richard Russo. It's a um, funny, light, uh, kind of easy to read book, but um, just engaging. Uh, the setting is academia. I, the novel is, I think, intended kind of as a send up of academia, but it's not really about academia. It's mostly about relationships and people and aging, um, things that most people can relate to, whether or not you work in an academic setting. I think it's just a fun, well-told, well-crafted, um, easy read. Uh, I think it's memorable for me, mostly because there were so many times when reading and I laughed out loud and wanted to tell somebody about how this funny part of the book that I just read. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that impulse to share that with somebody, um, I think demonstrated to me how much I enjoyed the book. Um, so my next one is the complete works of Shakespeare, which I'm not going to hold up. Um, uh, and if, I, if there was one thing that's influenced my life, it's Shakespeare. Um, and I think everyone can read it at some point, at least one play. Um, when I was uh, like two or three, my parents gave me a picture book of Midsummer Night's Dream, and I've been in love ever since. Um, and it, that's, I mean, that's all I can say, really. <laughs> It is with um, I did that in 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I could talk about it for hours. What's your favorite play? Oh, God, do I have to choose? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just read what you do about nothing. Coriolanus, King Henry the Fourth, Parts One, Two, King Henry the Fifth. Uh, King Lear is amazing. Romeo and Juliet is actually amazing, despite what people say. Um, <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, then my last one is Where the Sidewalk Ends, which is one of um, three or four books of poems and drawings by Shel Silverstein. Um, and I'm just going to read the first one in this book. Um, it's called The Invitation. If you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, a magic bean buyer. If you're a pretender, come sit by my fire, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in, come in. Um, and they're all, some of them are hilarious, some of them are cute, like that one, um, but they're all amazing and they all have these really amazing um, <laughs> drawings that go with them. Um, uh, and I've been reading these um, forever um, 
And I, in third grade, we had to memorize things because they were trying to teach us to memorize things. And I would choose these poems all the time. Um, my favorite one is called Sick, uh, which is basically uh, this girl who's like listing all these symptoms. And she's like, I don't want to go to school. I have all of these things. And then at the end, her mom is like, or she says, wait, what's that? What's that you say? You say today is Saturday? Goodbye. I'm going out tonight. <laughs> Um, I have here all of the series of unfortunate events books. Um, it's a really incredible series. Uh, it's, there are children's books. I really like Lemony Snicket, who is the author, uh, particularly because he has this really incredible dry sense of humor that you don't often find in children's books. And aside from that, what I find particularly interesting about this series of children's books in particular is that um, they really explore uh, uh, like a lot of the failures that some children may encounter for their like adult guardians that is not often explored in other children's books. So the plot is that uh, the, there are three siblings who are orphans because their parents were killed in the fire and they're sent from uh, like guardian to guardian and all of them uh, are like failures in some way. Uh, some more obvious than others. Obviously like the big villain is Count Olaf who's trying to like sabotage them and steal their fortune. But there are also like more minor ways in which the adults in their life have failed them. Some of them are too like cowardly to, to stand up for them. Some of them are uh, negligent because they have other things they need to do. And it's just like, uh, it is kind of a sad story. The, the children are like oddly resilient throughout the entire thing and like self-directed, but very dry humor, very funny, very dark, but also like, yeah, just like an incredible, an incredible uh, like observation of the occasional failures of adults in children's lives. Oh, I'm next. Okay. Um, this is, uh, anybody who knows me knows that Spinoza is like the single most influential person in my life. Uh, he was a political philosopher that wrote um, in Amsterdam in the 1670s. Um, and particularly, The Ethics is the work that I want to focus on. He's written a few things, but The Ethics was definitely the most significant to me. Um, the Ethics talks about a lot of things. Uh, it, it's actually broken into five parts. Um, the first part is of God in which Spinoza talks about the origins of what he perceives as God. Um, he has like very strict definitions for what that means. Uh, but it then goes on to um, like talk about human emotions, uh, human bondage, and human freedom, and how emotions in particular are tied to the human pursuit of freedom, or what he calls emotional enslavement. Um, but the ethics in particular is a really interesting work because it's written entirely in geometric proofs. So it's like propositions, definitions, axioms, which does sound kind of boring. But what I found them actually to be like really incredibly poetic, like little poetic snippets that attempt to uncover some really interesting truths about humanity and like their pursuit for freedom. Uh, my last book is a lot lighter. <laughs> it's 75 birds, butterflies, and little beasts to make crochet. <laughs> um, this is a really fantastic book of patterns. It's very colorful and bright. Um, the beginning section has a directory of patterns um, of the finished products, and so you can sort of browse through them and pick your path, your you know your next projects. Um, and then in the latter half of the section or the book, there are two sections: knitting and crocheting. Um, the patterns are there. Um, they're very well detailed. They're very good patterns. Um, I've, I forgot to bring a couple things that I've made from here, but um, they are very usable patterns. Um, they have a lot of little doodads that you can make, but there's also some bigger projects towards the end, um, like some a little embellished um, tea cozy that utilizes some of the leaves and flowers and things like that. Um, there are also really helpful notes on abbreviations and symbols and materials you need, how to read the patterns, and how, how to do knitting and crocheting stitches. So if you're looking to learn this craft, this could be a useful book. Okay. <laughs> this is um, England proposed by Wallace Stegner, which is a great book. Um, he does a lot of writing about the West and um, just has these incredible descriptions of um, the canyons and mountains and everything that they find out there. So this is a frame story, and it's told by this man who is in a really bad place in his life. He's paralyzed, and um, his wife has just left him. And so he starts researching the history of his grandparents. And his grandmother was a printmaker who traveled and made prints for newspapers. And his grandfather was just a pioneer in um, oil 
mining. He was a mining um, like manager person. Um, anyway, uh, so the thing that Segner says um, is that he doesn't really care about any of that. The story is not important. The West is not important. The interesting part is how two such unlike particles clung together and under what strains rolling downhill into their future until they reach the angle of repose where I knew them. Mm. It's really good. This is Confessions of an Argentine Nerdy Warrior by Horatio Verbitsky. Um, he interviews a man who actually was an Argentine Nerdy Warrior. Um, so it's really interesting that you're getting a first-hand perspective of a man who um, was ordered to push people off of planes in the sky. Um, and he's really honest at some points in this. Um, so it's also kind of graphic, but um, there's an interesting nexus of him being a victim of higher powers and him being a perpetrator of violence. Mm -hmm. And um, so it really explores that role in a way that I haven't seen in a lot of other writing. And then also, um, just his relationship with the interviewer is really interesting because he wants the story, but he doesn't want to forgive him. He's not in a place where he is the person to forgive him. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting how they get closer together, but kind of unwillingly and kind of not entirely. And then the last book Ooh, of the day, <laughs> it's called Paper Cadavers. It's by Kirsten Welch, who's a professor that I studied with before I transferred to Marlboro. And it's uh, the archives of dictatorship in Guatemala. And the coolest thing, one of the coolest things that's ever happened is that a few years ago, some women who were charged with protecting a warehouse full of documents started looking at them and discovered that they were actually like millions of files from the Guatemalan dictatorship. And so they started researching them. They got teams of investigators in there. And so there's a lot of um, interesting politics behind this because um, obviously for some reason the government does not open the archives and so um, it's a challenge the whole way but she talks a lot about how uh, documents can be really important as tools in terms of oppressing people or in terms of freedom which is really cool to think about because sometimes they're so boring but <coughs> they actually are really powerful um, and how information is just like one of the most precious commodities. Did you notice that we started with a book about libraries and we ended with a book about archives? <laughs> <laughs> All of these books are available for you to check them out, and if you are interested in being a reviewer in the future, let me know. Thank you.